Hello and welcome. It's Monday, May 25th. I have to check my calendar. And this is Seeking Sustainability Live number 17. Yay! Thank you for joining us. How are you feeling on Monday? Everybody out there? <laughs> Thank you for joining us from Periscope, Twitter, and Facebook, and YouTube, and Twitch. Thank you very much. Make sure you write your comments and questions below as we get going. I appreciate you guys joining us on a Monday. Hopefully it's going well. Uh, today's special guest is a seasoned writer who uh, introduces so many wonderful things about Japan to the world through international uh, publications. Thank you. <laughs> Selena, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me on this uh, cool uh, podcast or stream that's been going on for a few weeks. I've seen so many great things in the last few few weeks. Yeah, so thank you for lot. joining. We uh, appreciated your comments and questions when we were talking to some of your coworkers and people that you know along the way. So thank you so much. Uh, do you want to start introducing yourself just briefly? Yeah, um, so my name is Selena, and I live in uh, suburban Tokyo, as we were t talking about just a few minutes ago. And uh, I am, I've been in Japan approximately half my life, on and off. Um, I'm Japanese-American, and I am a writer, and I'm also a social worker. How did you first uh, get interested in social work? Because I know you've done social work in both Japan and uh, Portland, where you were from, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Yeah, I've, I, I've only been uh, doing social work as kind of more of a profession for the last few years, but um, I was here in 2011, and I ended up uh, living in Fukushima for about a year doing some volunteering. Oh, wow. And um, before that, I had always done volunteering, and I'd always been interested in um, trying to help out in whatever way I could. And I actually took, uh, I took the Temple University NGO management course in Tokyo mm -hmm. uh, with Sarah Jean Rosito. Um, so I'd already kind of dipped my toe in there, but, uh, after the earthquake, I thought I really wanted to, um, explore, uh, helping professions as a more serious pursuit. Yeah. So uh, I, I ended up going back to graduate school. For Wonderful. For, for anybody out there, Sarah Jean, I have previously interviewed, I think it was last year, I talked about she does a variety of training and social work, and she's connected to lots of different organizations. I would love to get her back on the live stream. Can you recommend her to get on? I will, sure. <laughs> That'd be awesome. So looking at your... Uh, kind of your main website, the, how do we describe it? It's a portfolio site. Selena Hoy. Mm -hmm. And it's um, Selena. Selena, sorry. Mm -hmm. no Selena Hoy dot contently dot com. And you've got samples of all your works. I love this where it says 292 projects for 63 clients. That is so impressive. And you've done such a wonderful job, not only working for official government websites for Japan's government, but also airline magazines, a variety of work. One of my favorite, a few of my favorites we'll talk about today are from Atlas Obscura. How did you connect to all of these varied publications? Um, are you just reaching yeah. out to them yourself or do you have an agent? It, no, no agent. It's a mixture. I've been writing for more than 10 years. Um, and so to some extent, I do pitch. But mm -hmm. a lot of times editors reach out to me because I have done enough uh, work that people can Google me. And then, you know, if they Google Topic Japan, then they can often find things that I've already written. Mm -hmm. So I do have a fair number of editors who reach out to me as well. Mm hmm. Great. Yeah. Uh, before we dive into all your amazing work and talk about the stories behind the stories, uh, do you want to talk about Tell a little bit, your yeah. work with Tell? Yeah, so I am the outreach coordinator on staff at Tell, and Tell is a mental health organization that's been around for 43, 47 years, I believe now, since 1973. Um, it's a certified nonprofit mental health organization running a lifeline 
and a counseling center and uh, outreach programs. And I'm in charge of outreach programs. That's great. And they, they've been around for a while, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, coming up on 50 years now. Wow, that's awesome. And I, I think it's, you know, a Tokyo English Lifeline, but they're, they're a support service for so much more than just Tokyo. Anybody mm-hmm. around Japan can call in and you have multilingual support. Mm-hmm. Um, there's counseling, but there's also if you're stuck at the hospital, you need translation help, right? They step in. Yeah. Or, so, um, yeah. so Tel originally stood for Tokyo English Lifeline, but in recent years we've tried to move away from that and mm-hmm. just be called Tel, because we're no longer just in Tokyo. As as you mentioned, anyone throughout Japan can use our Lifeline. Uh, we're no longer just in English. As you mentioned, the counseling center has therapists who can do counseling in several languages, and we're no longer just a Lifeline. So we're doing all kinds of stuff. Um, we don't do phone. Uh, interpretation necessarily, but mm-hmm. we can point people to those resources. We have a really long list of resources that we help connect people with. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. I, I know uh, for us doing a local regional website, Get Hiroshima, whenever we did our map, we always put your number, the tell mm-hmm. number on, because when people get into trouble, it's such a valuable service for everybody around the country. So really appreciate the great work you guys do. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. on your bio for Tell, it talks about you working with immigrant and refugee communities. Yeah. So when I was doing my uh, master's in social work, um, both of my field placements, which is what we call our year-long internships that we have to do, um, were with refugee organizations. So I did a year with Japan Association for Refugees in Tokyo, and I did a year with uh, refugee settlement, uh, resettlement in Catholic Charities in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Wow, so interesting. And I love this part of your bio when you talk about being a bicultural Japanese-American. And you feel like that helps you make connections for people across cultural and language kind of barriers. Yeah, I, ho- I hope it does. You know, sometimes uh, it can be seen as uh, as a negative. I think some people, you know, like to push uh, folks from one, one way or the other, you know, uh, being told you're not pure or something like that uh, is common in Japan. But um, for the most part, I think that we are able to make connections by um, mm-hmm. having something in common. And, yeah. you know, we, we don't have to do that but just with ethnicity or language, but lots of different ways. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. A really sad story over the weekend, um, the famous actress from Terrace House who killed herself, mm-hmm. and she also uh, was talking about being biracial, bicultural. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, that really it was so powerful and sad and i really wish she had called you guys at tell or she had reached out to someone who actually could have helped her and what a sad horrible loss yeah it's it's uh it's such a shame and we still don't have enough resources for people who are struggling and there's still a lot of stigma and shame um around mental health issues and mental illness and uh one thing that i want to say is that, you know, one in four people in the, according to the World Health Organization, one in four people in their lifetime is going to struggle with a mental health issue. So it's extremely common. um, And it's nothing to be ashamed of it. If it's not you, it's someone you know, or someone you care about. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that. We should just get help, uh, encourage each other to get help and try to support each other. Thank you so much. Yeah, really important words to remember. I think especially now during the coronavirus, a lot of people are feeling really heavily hit by Mm -hmm. losing work or unsure of our situation. Everybody's been thrown off track, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, just fear, isolation, um, anxiety that's coming out of this situation. We're, We're facing... Uh, this global catastrophe together, kind of uh, uh, everyone in the world is is touched, really, um, and everyone's going to deal with that in a different way. But it's something that we're all um, having to deal with together. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And if people wanted to support Tell, are you guys taking donations online? Mm-hmm. Or yeah, mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. So the website is telljp.com, 
and uh, we are always taking donations. We train volunteers for the Lifeline. Um, we have various events, fewer in-person events now mm -hmm. um, because of COVID-19, but we've been doing some online events. Um, and we also work with companies uh, doing employee assistance programs and corporate trainings and things like that around mental health, too. That's great. I know you guys do a big event or maybe a few events running up the Tokyo Tower is one of your mm -hmm. fundraisers, right? Yeah. So in September, uh, I believe it's September 10th. I'm not sure what date it's going to fall in this year. It'll be the Sunday, I believe. That's closest to September 10th. Uh, September 10th is World Suicide Prevention Day. And so um, for the last few years, we've been assembling 500 people mm -hmm. to do time trials running up Tokyo Tower wow. uh, in order to raise awareness and funds for mental health and suicide prevention. That's great. Thank you so much for all the great work you guys do. Um, let's talk a little bit about your articles. And I think the articles also reflect that you come from kind of a background where you kind of take community or diversity in a little bit different vantage point than just your typical, uh, this is beautiful and you have to visit. You know, like I when I read your articles, I certainly get a sense that you're kind of taking a deeper approach, connecting more with people. And I really appreciate that from a travel writer, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Tokyo Tronic actually just says, what's your take on writing positive versus negative stuff related to Japan? Of course, positive writing while we cool Japan gets more attention on the interwebs, he says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I try... I try to not to buy into the stereotypes so much. There are a lot of um, surface level, uh, you know, quirky Japan, weird Japan stuff. And some of that has a basis in reality and some of it is um, really just uh, sold for clicks. And so I, I try to, to be uh, mindful of that and I try to be ethical about it um, and always try to get a... a little bit deeper into the story. One example is that I was asked to write about the um, Kanamara Matsuri, which is the penis festival in Kawasaki. Mm -hmm. And there are kind of, a, there are about a million stories people writing about, oh, look at this crazy thing that we do in Japan. But um, I was able to go and interview the, uh, the shrine priest, priestess and priest and talk about the, uh, the Shinto underpinnings of that, um, of that festival. And the reason that they're doing it and you know it's it's fertility and there, there's a lot of uh there's a lot of respect there mm -hmm. and there's also uh so there are also some cool things like um there are people who do cross-dressing who uh always go to that and so it's a real magnet for japanese people and in, in the some of them are in the trans or lgbtq spectrum some people are just uh like to dress up um but there's some interesting uh, folks who who attend and a good story behind it. So it's not just kind of, ah, Hello Kitty and penises kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. for sure. And I, I think not only when we're talking about writing in print or writing online for websites, but definitely you see a lot of that with YouTube travel videos too, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot mm -hmm. of young, I, I would say young energy, <laughs> focused on you know what you would see in tv shows about japan abroad the weird the wacky the superficial so when you can go deeper and give us more depth and more heritage mm -hmm. and more culture mm -hmm. definitely i appreciate that and i'm sure a lot of people do what is i was talking to tokyo cheapo the other day 80% of travelers are now looking for sustainable options, right? And mm -hmm. that's even mm -hmm. before coronavirus. So for sure, people who will be coming to Japan or people domestically traveling will be looking for more culturally rich, meaningful experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I pulled this one out, uh, your visit to Hokkaido. And you say, well, out on the ridge, I love the the picture of the the natural onsen as well mm -hmm. the rotenburo outside and mm -hmm. and i imagine the outside rotenburos they're going to be a lot easier to sell because you can do social distance fresh air that kind of thing mm -hmm. so it's a beautiful place mm -hmm. and you write while out on the ridge explorers may meet one of the many animals who make their home here like hokkaido brown bears red foxes or the pika a rabbit-like mammal 
that was the inspiration of Pikachu. The Ainu believe that this is the playground of the gods, and the gods manifest in animal form when in human, when in the human form. From mm-hmm. up here, despite the sometimes severe landscape, it's easy to glimpse the divine. Mm. So what an amazing experience. You met with some local Ainu people and I did, yeah. I was I was very lucky to be able to interview some Ainu uh folks, including some Ainu elders. And uh I really wanted to make sure that when we we're writing about um Hokkaido and Asahikawa, that article is about that we gave proper uh respect to the folks who'd been there before. You know, mm-hmm. the Japanese have only been in Hokkaido for, um, you know, mainland Japanese have only been in Hokkaido for maybe 100, 150 years, really. Mm-hmm. And I knew we were there first. Yeah, that's awesome. Really fantastic. So you were able to kind of, I mean, a lot of the times you'll get these contracts to go and write travel stories and you'll not be able to push the meaningful contact con- context to the stories. So really well done on your part too. Thank you. I love this one about the Kyoto fortune cookies. Mm. What an interesting story. And I pulled out my Atlas Obscura, but it wasn't in my version. Mm. Um, But this you wrote for Atlas Obscura, right? Yes. Do you want to tell this story? I think it's fantastic. I had never heard it before. Yes. So uh, a lot of people think that fortune cookies are originally a Chinese um, treat. Um, but they actually uh, are, there's some evidence that they're actually Japanese. And so um, there's a, a long history of the fortune cookie uh, dating back to the Edo period. So maybe the 1600s, we have reference to them in Japan. Uh, and then they traveled to the U.S. Um, with some Japanese immigrants. And they were served in uh, like the Nihomachi or the Japantown, little Tokyo in uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. And then when the uh, Japanese Americans were interned, uh, they were, they, they lost their businesses, they lost their bakeries, they lost the their homes and their gardens. And um, the, the Chinese Americans had also been living kind of uh, right next to the Japanese Americans, there's a lot of cultural crossover. People are living in the same neighborhoods, you know, because of redlining, mm-hmm. because they were forced to live in certain neighborhoods. And um, so the some of the Chinese neighbors ended up um, continuing to sell those things and uh, serve them in restaurants and things like that. And so they actually became known as a, a Chinese treat, mm-hmm. but they originated in Japan. And uh, some of the bakeries that I visited in Kyoto are bakeries that have been make that are still making the original Japanese fortune cookie, which is in the same shape. Uh, it's a little bit bigger, a little bit harder, and it, it it's made with miso, mm-hmm. um, just a little bit of miso, which That's gives it a so certain so interesting. Change. And I, I thought it was really interesting how you said uh, at these traditional shops, it came from the Edo time they were making it, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they use the same system you would get like a, a good luck charm at the shrine. So mm-hmm. you would have daikichi, the best luck, or the medium luck, or mm-hmm. the not so good luck, and you would have that inside the cookie as well. Yes, yes, and you still do. So if you go to these shops in Kyoto, which uh, there, there, three or four of them are listed in my article, you can still get those cookies with the uh, big fortune, a super big fortune, uh, bad <laughs> fortune, you know, um, medium fortune, etc. That's great. So for this article, did you just travel to Kyoto, or did you also go to the states? Like I, I didn't go to the States. Uh, I just traveled to Kyoto, but I was able to uh, get in touch with, I think it was the, the Japanese American Historical Society mm-hmm. and talk to some of the uh, Nikkei elders there too, which was a wow. really wonderful experience for me because I, I'm Nikkei myself. And, mm-hmm. you know, I got to speak to some of our community leaders in the States that um, are still um, bringing these traditions forward. Mm-hmm. I and, was and just, uh, end of last year, I went to San Jose and I went to Japantown mm-hmm. and I was walking around and I love all the plaques that they have around uh, talking about the history and heritage of the area. And unfortunately, a lot of things were closed when I was there, um, but I'd love to go back and see if they have fortune cookies. What a fun story. I love that. Yeah, a few of the bakeries uh, in both LA and uh, San Francisco, Japantowns do have 
fortune cookies. Wow. I'm going to seek it out next time. Um, really interesting story. You were talking, you're a, a animal advocate, I would say. You, you love animals. I and do. a lot of your stories are focused on vegan food or um, this story caught my eye about the animal rescue flights. I had never mm -hmm. heard of them before. Do you want to explain that story a little bit? Sure. So uh, when I was in Fukushima, I was working actually with uh, a couple of animal rescue organizations, um, helping people get their pets out of the zone and sheltering some of them uh, because they weren't allowed to bring their pets into the um, the evacuation centers. Mm -hmm. That law has since changed, oh, but at yeah. the time they weren't allowed. Um, oh, and so I ended up, mm. yeah. And um, I ended up working up there for about a year, but I, um, I ended up kind of getting fairly entrenched in animal rescue mm -hmm. and uh, started working with an organization um, which is run by military spouses out of Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would, Okinawa has a very high kill rate uh, for strays. And so they would, um, fly animals out of Okinawa to other parts of the country, to Tokyo. Um, and also sometimes they had adopters back in the States. So I got very good at, uh, traveling on planes with animals. Wow. And I know how to do that. Um, and we have a, we had a, we have a very good network who knows all the rules and regulations about the booking and everything. And so when the opportunity came, to write about it, you know, um, the points guy wanted somebody who knew about this. And I said, oh, I've done that so many times I could easily write about it. So I, I was able to write how to do that for the points guy. Yeah, great. And it, I was really surprised. But once I read it, I was like, of course, if you want um, to save animals in areas where the strays are being killed mm -hmm. and people want to adopt on the other side of the ocean mm -hmm. and the price of a flight is much cheaper for someone to accompany the pet than mm -hmm. to send the pet through a service. Mm -hmm. You were talking about thousands of dollars versus hundreds of dollars for right. the flight ticket. And I thought, yeah. what a great idea. I love that kind of innovation, creativity, thinking outside mm -hmm. the box. That was fantastic. Who thought of that idea? People have been doing it for years, really. I mean, there are some areas that have so many strays and so many uh, animals that are dying, and there are some that uh, there's a demand for mm -hmm. um, for rescue pets. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I know Hiroshima recently changed the rules, so they do not kill the strays anymore. And there's uh, certain agencies like Peace Wonko japan and they mm -hmm. take them to the countryside and they have a big farm mm -hmm. and they try to retrain them and then get them adopted again so there are some great organizations in japan mm -hmm. doing really good work yeah and you know uh, it's kind of uh people in japan tend to buy animals at pet shops and they charge they charge thousands of dollars and it's usually from a puppy mill or a, um you know the animals with pedigrees but um rescue is a lot cheaper yeah, and they, that whole system, the pet store, mm -hmm. in the drinking area system and mm -hmm. buy it when you're a bit tipsy for your wife or child or girlfriend is, is mm -hmm. just wrong, you know, because they end up going to families that aren't ready for a pet or, or lose interest once they're not puppies or kittens mm -hmm. anymore, mm -hmm. right? So For once it's not trendy anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for this article because it was so informative and also such a great reminder that there is fantastic innovation and, you know, people can think of solutions um, if, you know, presented with a problem and they're able to think about solutions. So that was mm -hmm. that was so encouraging. Um, this next article about the Olympic world kimonos, I had not heard about this and I thought it was so fun. And of course, for coming up to the Olympics, now they have more time to get it done mm -hmm. <laughs> for next year. Do you want to introduce this article? Yeah. Um, so I just, I, I doubt she's watching, but I wanted to give a shout out to Victoria from uh, Guy Jean Pot, who told me about this story originally. We had a coffee and she mentioned it. Um, there are there's a a group out of Kurume in Kyushu, mm -hmm. which is a, a city kind of near Fukuoka, mm -hmm. 
And uh, they are trying to make a kimono for every single country that is participating in the Olympics. That's an amazing so it's around challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Kimonos. And each kimono is um, designed around themes from that country. Um, and they are working with kimono artisans all over Japan, uh, for, and including sometimes um, middle schoolers or high schoolers to help with the design and submit ideas. And then they're also doing cross-cultural design. So uh, maybe a kimono designer. I think one that I highlighted there was a uh, Kyoto Yuzen designer met with an Indonesian batik designer mm-hmm. and they collaborated yeah. on design. That was so um, was interesting. Really yeah. So yeah. different styles of, of dyeing the material, different mm-hmm. styles of design from different cultures that they're representing. I thought, you know, really fascinating. I hadn't read an article with so much detail about this topic. Mm-hmm. It's really mm-hmm. fun. So are they going to finish by next year? Uh, I have not checked on them recently, but they were getting pretty close to their goal, I think. So I think at this point, they probably can. Uh, although it's a nonprofit, and they are relying on donations to um, keep making the kimono. So, um, you know, they're working with a lot of artisans, and it's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. Ta- you know, it takes months to make a handmade, beautiful mm-hmm. Kimono. But I, I realized, uh, talking to Paprika Girl last week, how sustainable kimono is. And, mm. uh, you know, I always assumed it was sustainable because of the culture, but mm. it's actually also very sustainable because you don't waste any of the material. It's mm-hmm. used for generations. She's using her great grandmother's kimono that's been repaired and, you know, like it's it's used for a long time and really mm-hmm. high quality. Right. And the way that they cut them, you know, that it's just squares and rectangle patterns, mm-hmm. uh, panels. So there isn't any uh, cloth waste. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Mari Bont on Periscope, thank you for your comment. Hello, what a great idea. Yes, indeed. And he also says, or she also says, uh, Versace kimono for Italy. <laughs> mm. go to their site uh, I think it's called what is it called One World Kimono Project Kimono Project if you google them they mm-hmm. have a page for each of the country's kimonos that they finished so if you want to see what your country's kimono looks like um, go and check it out it's so beautiful yeah great yeah I think it, it says here the courtesy of Kimono Project so One World Kimono Project if people google they should be able to find it and uh, find out more. Thank you. Uh, this article, of course, you talked about the penis festival mm-hmm. that you went to and you talked to the shrines. And this article, I was really impressed by both you and the publisher that you got this published in Playboy, which is mm-hmm. not usually a focus on women in Playboy in in terms of feminism. So you mm-hmm. want to introduce this article I thought it was fascinating yeah so uh, there is a sex toys bar in Shibuya called vibe one and uh, I was talking with the editor of Playboy um, the, the lifestyles editor of Playboy and my, my editor is a woman and I, uh, when we were talking about this I, I was kind of I wasn't sure if I wanted to contribute to Playboy because I had those same associations as you right Um, but when I was talking to her about it, I said, you know, this is a feminist, uh, this is a feminist shop, you know, their stated intentions are for female pleasure. Um, and so if we can have that angle, then I would like to write it. And she said, absolutely. So, um, I was lucky to be able to go in to write about, uh, the shop with, that angle and with those intentions. Um, so in the bar, there are a few hundred different kinds of sex toys that women can go and look at. And uh, it's not a bar to have sex and it's not a bar to try them on yourself, um, you know, in the bar. It's a bar where you can, you know, go with your friends and look at them and turn them on and, you know, see them, see them up close. Because a lot of times with sex toys, you're either ordering them on the internet and you don't really know what it looks like or feels like or does beforehand or you have to go someplace like Don Quixote which is not really super 
um, welcoming place, mm -hmm. I think, to, or, for women. Or like you mentioned, there are sex shops um, where they do have sex toys for women, mm -hmm. but often men are working there. Mm -hmm. So this is a shop that's really made to support and give information to women in a place where they feel comfortable asking yes. questions and yes. getting information, right? And it's run by women and it's staffed by women, uh, women and or uh, gender nonconforming non-binary people. Yeah, that's great. And you, you said you had to get buzzed in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have a rule. Men are allowed, but um, they have to be accompanied by a woman. If it's a group of people, there have to be more women than men. Yeah, really, really interesting. And I'm, you know, it sounds strange and some people maybe feel uncomfortable, but it's just you never hear of this kind of shop or this kind of support for women in Japan. Mm -hmm. And the sex of the women is as important as the men, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it sounds crazy to say it out loud. but yeah. I talk about that in the article a little bit, about how much of the sex industry is really um, aimed at the at, at men and the male gaze and uh, how I think some of the store clerks were saying 90% of the people who come into a sex a uh, toy shop or donkey, you know, sex area are men. And so it's not really a welcoming place for women to explore. Yeah, great. So it seems like an odd article for feminist, you know, to read and write, but, you know, fantastic and really well done. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad they published it. Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, I often talk about Made in Japan as a fantastic way to support local economies and artisans and culture mm -hmm. and everything. Um, you had this great article made in Fukuoka. Did you spend some time in Fukuoka? I did. I got to go to Fukuoka a few times uh, last year, and I've written a few different little pieces about um, the local local things to do in Fukuoka. Mm -hmm. So you did you talk to some local artisans? and? I did, yeah. Um, so let's see, from that piece, I think you're talking about, which maybe was in um, Silk Silk Air, maybe. Silk One of Wind, the airlines, like yeah. That, airline magazine. Um, yeah, I got to spotlight, I think, five uh, small local businesses in mm -hmm. Fukuoka. And one of them was a bar and coffee shop where the bar owner is making all of his own liqueurs by hand mm -hmm. um, from Japanese ingredients and uh, local ingredients um things like corn liquor and um not not just your standard you know shochu sake but all kinds of different interesting uh libations mm -hmm. um another person i talked to were uh kurume kurume kasuri which is a, a type of fabric woven fabric that's made only in this area kurume which is where actually the kimonos um headquarters are made oh, too. Oh, wow. Did you get to visit the kimono making uh, facility? I visited their shop uh -huh. for that, uh, their retail shop for that wow. uh, interview. Did you get to try any on? Yeah, I did. Oh, and wow. I, I, got to, I got to just touch and feel and, you know, hear about the process, Yeah. Uh, which is a really involved process and so many artisans and so many traditional um, traditional processes that mm -hmm. it, it takes such a long time to make, but it's made with such care. Yeah. And, and how wonderful that most or all kimono is still only made in Japan. I, I hear that from uh, Clementine Sandner, who runs Mikan uh, upcycle kimono shop to make bags out of old obis and everything. And I heard that from Paprika Girl last week as well. And it always surprises me that it's not outsourced to save mm -hmm. on labor costs and stuff. It mm -hmm. is all made in Japan and it's really impressive. So you you have a few articles about Fukuoka and it's so nice for a Tokyo Raider to see you uh, <laughs> encouraging people to get to Fukuoka. What a great city, you know, and-, and I love Fukuoka. And linked by yeah. Shinkansen, it's not that hard to get to, mm -hmm. right? I, I, you know, every time people ask me what should I do in Japan, I said get out of Tokyo because there's so many there's so many beautiful places to see in Japan, and I really feel like you don't, um, it, you get to know the real Japan when you leave uh, Tokyo or Osaka. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that that brings us to another article where uh, Jordi, Jordi, Jordi Meow, Meow. <laughs> I want to say Meow like the cat. Is that how you say his name? Yes, I don't know if it's um, yeah, I don't know where his name came from, but it is Jordi Meow. Yeah. And he said ex in the article, you quoted him as saying exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Head out of Tokyo, go anywhere. You'll definitely find something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you want to introduce his story a little bit? Yeah, so Jordi is a photographer and he loves Haikyo, which is uh, the visiting of abandoned places. Um, it's kind of a um, disaster. It's sort of a disaster tourism, not necessarily a, a, a something that's a disaster area, although that is also included, but places that have been abandoned, um, places, uh, it could be old amusement parks, it could be old factories, it could be old houses. Um, and he makes beautiful photographs of this those is places. Just stunning. This is one example at a abandoned water park for example, and he had gorgeous photos from an abandoned island. Where is it? I've seen it in films. Is it in Nagasaki? Uh, maybe Gunkajima is yes. what you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes. Uh, Gunkanjima, yeah. And which, so. Which is an uh, old, um, let's see, ba battleship island, I think is what we call island, it yeah. in English. And uh, he was he got special permission to go inside the building. Usually you're not allowed. And he got some really stunning photos. Um, also, if you come to Hiroshima, Rabbit Island also has mm -hmm. some of these abandoned buildings from uh, it actually used to make poison gas on the island. So they have some of these big, crazy old buildings and really interesting just to see from the outside. Um, it's a strange kind of tourism. But mm -hmm. it offers insight into history and heritage mm -hmm. that going to uh, cities with all the new buildings and all the oshare and modern places mm -hmm. really doesn't give you the same sense of, right? Yeah, I think some of those, some people are uh, interested in that kind of dark tourism or that, um, but I think it gets under the skin and gives you a little bit of a deeper look at a place if you can do it respectfully, right? Because yeah. um, as you were saying earlier, there are some people, maybe there are some famous YouTubers whose names we will not mention, but who've come and been really disrespectful in the way that they looked at that dark underbelly. Yeah, we so. don't, we always want to, you know, when you're in a strange place, you always want to have respect and show your sense of place, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, being uh, in Hiroshima for many years, sometimes, you see people in front of the Ebom Dom posing as if they were at Disneyland, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, have your sense of place. A lot of mm -hmm. people died here. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you're at an abandoned house, um, that might be sad for the neighbors, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, having your sense of place. And I was very impressed. This was sponsored by the government, right? This article. Yeah, yeah the, that was a article that I did for the JNTO, Japanese National Tourism Organization. Mm -hmm. I was surprised too that they wanted to do something about Haikyo, but I think Jordi's photos are so gorgeous oh. that it's hard not to share them. Beautiful. Definitely check that um, website out. That was, uh, I just took it down again. Um, Japan Monthly Web Magazine. If people search Google for that, I think they'll find and then his name is Jordi Meow, Meow, like, Meow, the, cat. like, yes. like the cat. Um, and you interviewed a really famous feminist author, singer, mm -hmm. actress, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Miyako Kawakami. Mm -hmm. yeah, do you want to talk about that? That was a really interesting mm -hmm. article. Yeah, I got to meet uh, Kawakami Miyako a few months ago. Um, before the release of her novel in English. So uh, she's pretty well known in Japan, I think. She's written quite a few books, but up until this latest release, she had only one novella in English, which is called Ms. Ice Sandwich, and it's a really um, lovely, quirky novella. Um, 
So her novel Chichitoran, which is uh, titled Breasts and Eggs in English, was just released um, in English. And it won the Akutagawa Prize here in Japan, which is maybe one of the largest or the most um, prestigious literary prizes in Japan. Um, And she talks about, uh, she's talking about women and Japan and maybe the middle class and the lower and the the working class. Um, So she she's showing us uh, some characters that maybe we don't always associate with Japan. I love that about her. And she's also from Osaka. Mm -hmm. So she's giving that us that um, Osaka glimpse of the country, too. Fantastic. And I love this quote um, in your article uh, interview with her. And you say, Mieko Kawakami writes about women and gender, but she wishes society would progress to a point where she didn't have to. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. so powerful. Such a beautiful play on words. And it's actually something that I've heard from people who do sustainable fashion companies, right? Mm-hmm. Or fair trade. Or, you know, they're working so hard to do a more ethical type of business. And they Mm -hmm. always say, I wish I didn't have to. I wish this was the norm. Yeah, I want to work myself or I want to write myself out of a job. Yes, exactly. That's the goal. Exactly. Um, And and she's talking about, you know, people, there's pain in her work. And she, she thinks that some young people will identify with that pain. But she wants to help move things along far enough so that that pain is not identifiable anymore. Yeah, really fantastic job. Great article. And that was with a magazine called Kinfolk? Kinfolk. Kinfolk? Yeah, Kinfolk magazine. So if you search Google for Kinfolk magazine, you'll be able Mm -hmm. to find that wonderful article. Yeah, and the magazine is originally out of Portland, Oregon. It's now published out of Copenhagen. And they, uh, there is a Japanese edition, which is entirely translated into Japanese if people want to read uh, her original untranslated words. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for that article. Um, going back a few years to a very interesting article you wrote about a pump company, Mitsua Pump Company. And I thought this was really nice to show because... Uh, often Japanese companies, when they talk about SDGs, when they talk about sustainability, they often mention their work abroad mm. as well as their work in Japan. And I, I often get frustrated thinking they need to focus more on problems happening in Japan. It's easy to focus abroad. But of course, both is really important. So it was mm-hmm. really nice to see that they're making water pumps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you remember this? I think this is a few years back. (laughs) It is a few years back. I can't remember very well. I did a lot. I did uh, quite a few business profiles for uh, Jetro. Uh Uh, They're trying to um, um, talk about small and medium enterprises and help those people out. So there were quite a few cool products um, that I got to learn about through, through uh, that, that series. Um, but I'm sorry, I cannot remember no, no, the details. No, no, that's fine. Um, <laughs> I, I was, I was just was very impressed um, that I read it. And of course, they're providing uh, clean water pumps for beer companies in Japan mm-hmm. and also clean water pumps for uh, places abroad where they have sanitation issues. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a really beautiful combination of both helping businesses and people in Japan and abroad. And they talk about it as a, a kind of long-term experiment, right? Thinking of our future customers and uh, people coming from abroad who might live and work in Japan. Like there's a very mm-hmm. long-term thinking here. And mm-hmm. I found that really beautiful. And there are so many con- companies doing... Um, even small companies doing these innovative projects like that. And if they can get their ideas spread out a little farther, then uh, they can really um, help us along, I think, environmentally, you know, with state sustainability. And uh, so yeah, definitely. it's great to look out for those. Yeah. Here's a, a combination of articles um, that I thought we could talk about. You covered pottery 
in Miyagi, is it? Mm-hmm. And then Gold Leaf. Is that from Hiroshima? Recently, I learned that Hiroshima is famous for Gold Leaf. And then Kakigori and Motainai. So this is a combination of quite different articles. <laughs> And I, yeah, so gold leaf is actually uh, from Kanazawa. Okay. Kanazawa is, um, they, they produce 99, 98% of the country's gold leaf. Yeah. Um, and they are, they're still making um, by hand. Some, mm-hmm. some of the gold leaf is by hand. So if you think about uh, the Golden Pavilion mm-hmm. in Kyoto, it is made by artisans in Kanazawa. And I thought Kakigori. Mm-hmm. is great because it's getting hotter so everybody wants to talk about kakigori have you seen vegan kakigori often it's covered in cream mm-hmm. um, but usually you can get it vegan right there there are a couple of places in tokyo definitely where you can get it vegan there's a place in the waseda area i wrote an article about it and i don't have the name but uh, that has soy milk, con- soy condensed milk syrups. Mm-hmm. And there are also some um, natural fruit syrups that don't use the condensed milk mm-hmm. at a few places. There's a place in Daikanyama, I think, that has them. Uh, I don't know about Hiroshima, though. Sorry. No, no, that's I'm okay. Sure, I'm sure there must be. You know, those yeah. chemical syrups that they use are probably accidentally vegan, too. The yeah. ones that you can get at the fair. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I often you know, just by chance fall into some places that do natural syrups for the Mm -hmm. kakigori. And I just Mm -hmm. love that, like fresh fruit with sugar and it just tastes so much better. Mm -hmm. Um, I love Miyagi though. And I I visited Miyagi in Tohoku last year myself. Such a beautiful area. Did you go up there for the article? I did. Yeah. I love Miyagi. I've been there quite a few times. Uh, When I was living in Fukushima, I visited Miyagi quite a few times. Um, and I got to meet some artisans doing various things, pottery. Also, I wrote an article about kokeshi, mm-hmm. which is a tohoku craft for the BBC. Um, so Miyagi is one of my favorite places in Japan. People are really kind. Yeah, um, and, and very relaxed. And mm-hmm. Hiroshima... Uh, we're quite famous for kagura in Hiroshima and Shimane area, but also they have a different kind of kagura mm-hmm. up there in Miyagi, which we mm-hmm. saw, and that was interesting. Um, in that same page, there was information about the motai nai. Okay, I, yeah, I wrote uh, I wrote an article for <clears throat> highlighting Japan, which is a it's a magazine that's put out by the Japanese Ministry of the Interior. It's like a, 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 a it's a pro, it's a PR mag, um, but the Motai Nai movement was actually um, inspired by uh, by a, a woman from let's see her name is Wangan, um, and she's a she was a Nobel Prize winner. Mm-hmm. Um, so the article is about the Japan's tie to her mm-hmm. and how she kind of helped the Motai Nai movement to be to blossom a little bit more mm-hmm. in Japan, even though it's an old concept in Japan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was helpful. Still along. very relevant. <laughs> always, always mm-hmm. relevant. Motai nai culture. Let's bring it back in full force. Mm-hmm. Reuse and uh, reduce everything. Yeah. So Motai nai, um, so her, sorry, her name is Wangari Matai. Uh-huh. She's, she was from Kenya. She was a Nobel Prize uh, winner. And she was a social and environmental activist. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she helped to um, to promote the Motai Nai movement mm-hmm. on her trips to Japan. And it was pub- publicized and popularized by some newspapers mm-hmm. in Japan. And uh, Motai Nai is kind of what, what we say in, in the article, but also in general, is it's reduce, reuse, recycle, but also respect. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we're, we're respecting our things and we are using them for a long time and we're using them carefully, um, which I think uh, connects a little bit to the Kolmari movement as well. Yeah. yeah. Can, can we use things well? And yeah. And say thank you to them. And especially I think people uh, connect it often with food, mm-hmm. which ties in really nicely with the second harvest 
uh, article that you did years ago, but for the food bank mm -hmm. after the Tohoku disaster, and you talk about second harvest. Um, have you worked with Second Harvest? You seem to know the the people that run it quite well. Uh, I've volunteered there a few times. Yes, mm -hmm. I've, I um, and also they so they give food to the Japan Association for Refugees mm -hmm. for the refugees. So there's a lot of um, interconnection with the um, the nonprofit mm. sector. And there was some information maybe you had written or somebody else available on Tokyo Cheapo mm -hmm. about volunteering for a second harvest. And you mentioned when we were talking to them that they are lacking volunteers, of course, during coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Second Harvest is a wonderful charity nonprofit organization that gets uh, food that might otherwise be thrown away. And they repurpose it and they, you know, of course, they make sure that it's edible and safe and they repurpose it for food boxes and they make meals and they feed people who are unhoused. And they also feed people in orphanages, families who uh, don't have enough, you know, they, they need food assistance, um, elder care homes, things like that. And they're a wonderful organization. They take volunteers on a weekly basis to help cook for their soup kitchen mm -hmm. um, and to hand out food packages uh, they've seen a big spike in need because of the coronavirus and people losing their livelihoods. They, uh, a lot of small families and families with single parents um, have a real increased need right now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they've had a lot more demand. But because people can't go outside and you're not supposed to ride public transportation, they've also seen a real decrease in volunteers. And so they had put out a call um, maybe a week or two ago saying, we need volunteers. We can't do this much longer without help. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so important. And it's so difficult during this um, stay-at-home social distancing time mm -hmm. to get volunteers for organizations. So if you are willing and able and take precautions, hopefully you can volunteer or make donation online and uh, help them. I know it's it's also difficult because a lot of restaurants and supermarkets and places that would have been giving them the food is also closed. So they've mm -hmm. kind of lost a uh, supply chain mm -hmm. now, right? They, um, they have an amazing uh, network, though. So they've oh, been, good. They're, they're working hard still. Good, good. Well, I heard uh, maybe from you or someone that they were starting to get it more directly from farmers because... Um, they had a lot of great connections there, so that's very good news. But yeah, please support Second Harvest. What a great organization. Um, speaking of rice, <laughs> nice transition there. <laughs> um, you had some beautiful articles. One was for the BBC Travel about ingenious solution made of rice. That is just stunning. The rice fields mm -hmm. designed like that, right? Do you want to yeah. introduce that? So uh, I think Joan talked about this too in her uh, interview about Fukushima, but this town up in uh, Aomori, is it? Inakadate is the name of the town. Um, they make uh, rice art pictures in their fields, and they've been doing this for quite a while now. Uh, their first few efforts were pretty wonky. You can see some um, examples of that in the article because they hadn't got the, the balance and the perspective right yet. But now they, they uh, plant these incredible intricate uh, portraits and photorealistic images in the rice using many different varieties of rice. And uh, one of the things that some of the residents said to me is, this town is, you know, it's an agricultural town. We don't have much, but you know what we have? We have rice. <laughs> so let's, Let's make the most of what we have and let's use our creativity. And uh, they have been doing that for, I think, more than a decade. And now and, they're, uh, they're famous the, around the world because of it. And they they're are. stunning. It, it's hard to believe that that is actual rice, different colored rice, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really? And it's a community effort. You know, everybody gets together and plants together and then they all harvest together. Uh, you know, there are not that many, only a few thousand people, I think, in that town. Mm -hmm. But uh, everyone gets together and, and tourists come from all over the world uh, during the season, which is in summer. July mm -hmm. and August, I think, is the peak of when you can see these rice art. 
I wonder if they'll um, continue this year. Maybe we can get some domestic tourists to go up there safely mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. by July, hopefully. Things are starting to open up in Japan, right? Um, we have to find way forward to move forward with tourism, but in a way that's safe for locals as well as visitors, right? Mm -hmm. Outdoor events is a good, good option. You also covered in Australia, there was a Japanese sculptor. Yeah, so this was one for Atlas Obscura. Uh, there was a Japanese sculptor who um, his has, he really dedicated the later part of his life to making art about biodiversity. And uh, so he, he loves rice and he's especially interested in wild rice. Um, so he made a lot of sculptures around wild rice. And the reason that he wanted to make sculptures about wild rice is because he said um, it's kind of the, the genetic blueprint for us to live really because rice feeds um, I think it's something like over one third of the world depends on rice for their main staple crop. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when we have, if we were to have like, for example, a, a nuclear event that wipes out um, swaths of crops and, you know, life, uh, we, if we save and if we care about biodiversity and wild rice and these um, sort of mother crops, then we can bring it back. And so uh, he made, um, sculptures dealing with biodiversity and preserving our biodiversity. That's such a beautiful story and so important to remember that, you know, like in our modern convenient lives and all the food waste and uh, unnecessary food that we have around us and when it comes down to it, rice and beans and vegetables is all you mm -hmm. need. Wonderful. Um, last, we're running out of time here. There's so many amazing articles to talk about. Uh, the last one I wanted to mention about child safety. That was an interesting article. Why Japanese kids can walk to school alone. Mm. So one of yeah, that one's a few years back now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there was, yeah, I, I wrote about how kids... You know, we, we see these very small kids on the subways and the trains, um, and it's something that's a shock often to um, tourists or people from abroad is that they don't expect a five-year-old to be on the train by themselves. And so um, the article talks about why that is and why it's possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there are some other people who said it's safety, and that is true to an extent, or the crime rate, and I think that's true to an extent. But um, I think something that I talked about in the article is that it's a, it, it's down to um, kind of a com communal society and, and us taking out taking care of each other, mm -hmm. and the way that we can sort of expect that kids are able to talk to strangers um, in a way that maybe we don't expect them to, at least in the states. You mm -hmm. know, we we tell kids not never to talk to strangers. Right. But uh, I think kids are taught a little more that they can go into the corner shop or they can ask a nice lady or they can talk to the station agent and they will be helped. Mm -hmm. And definitely one of the reasons I loved having kids here and raising kids here and, and not worrying about gun violence, not, not really worrying about them as much as if I lived in the States, my own country um, where I grew up. But mm -hmm. I know that my neighbors are keeping an eye on them. And mm -hmm. if they have trouble, they'll ask the neighbor for help. And mm -hmm. uh, we have a community board of messages that go around giving us information. We have people from the PTA who stand on corners when kids mm -hmm. are coming home from school, watching right. out and making sure they're safe. Of course, we have problems in Japan. Of course, mm -hmm. you know. We definitely do. But that community organization, you know, almost every neighborhood has a neighborhood association, and those are still pretty strong. Yeah. And people are still kind of looking out for their neighbors. Definitely. Mm -hmm. It's a, a really beautiful, wonderful thing about Japanese culture, I think, which has continued over the years into mm -hmm. modern life. Well, so I hope, we can, I hope we can keep it going. Yeah, I hope so, too. 
Uh, there's so many wonderful things that you're introducing to the world from your articles and I thank you and appreciate you so much for all of your work in spreading not only the typical messages of Japan and travel to the world but the atypical, the deeper, the more meaningful. So thank you so much for all you do, Selena. Serena, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, we, have, we have a comment. Prasanna says, Selena, thank you so much for so much information, going through the TEL site and can learn a lot from your articles, brilliant. How many days it typically it takes typically for you to write an article? How do you decide on finalizing about writing an article? So well, how long does it, it usually take you? It depends. It can take anywhere from a day to a month, depending on the length and how many people I need to talk to and you know the, the subject matter. So And when you negotiate for the article, they give you a fair amount of time so you can research it properly and get mm. them drafts and go back and right. forth? Sometimes it's a quick turnaround. Somebody needs something now because it's a timely topic. Um, but for some of these, like Atlas Obscura or the BBC, usually I can have at least a couple of weeks to go and get that research done and have time to talk to people and go meet them in person, hopefully, and um, see things with my own eyes. That's great. And such a fantastic question. Thank you so much. Great way to end it. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and thank you so much, Selena, for all of your information and all of your hard work. And Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been fun talking good, to you. Good, good. Thank you. We'll have you again sometime. Catch up on all your news. Okay. Let's take care of each other now. Yeah, for sure. Take care, everybody. See you tomorrow again at 5. We have talks all week at 5 o'clock, so please join us again tomorrow and every day this week. Bye. Have a good day.